of us, the thought of a pro contract is nothing but a, a dream. For one man in particular, Christian Meyer, he uh, had an 11 year pro career and actually gave up his last year contract with Orica Greenedge for uh, a different direction, different journey in life. And I think that's a, quite an interesting story. So while we're in Girona, I wanted to find out a little bit more about what makes this man tick. So thanks for joining us, Christian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so basically that's, that's about, about true. I did have uh, another year on my contract and I decided to, to stop one year early. I had a chat with the team and they were you know, very supportive. And that kind of all came about because, I mean, we, we'd already started La Fabrica a couple of years ago, so that was going, and then we'd started Espresso Mafia, which was also going really well, and then, you know, we were, had plans for another business here, the service course, and, you know, the way that kind of been going for me in cycling, and for me, cycling was always something that I loved. Riding my bike was my big passion when I was a kid. You know, I was just, when the, you know, the bug caught me, all I wanted to do was ride and I rode everything I could. I rode on the track, I rode cyclocross, I rode on the road, mountain bikes. And eventually what happened, so you get to a point where you kind of think, well, well how can I ride my bike every day? How can, how can I do that? And the obvious answer is, well, racing. If you become a professional racer, then you could just get to ride your bike every day. So I decided that I was going to be a professional racer. So just kind of, I don't know, I decided when I was maybe 16, that I wanted to be a professional bike rider. So I started and then at 18, packed my bags and I went to Belgium for, for the first three months of the year and didn't really have a plan, just knew that if I wanted to ride my bike I'd, or be a bike racer, I had to go where bike racing was the biggest, you know? And I thought, well, that's Belgium. So I went and kind of one day met some guys who actually ran this development team and then got on with them and did three months there, training camps, and it was, it was really cool. And then came back and at that, you know, just that time there really boosted your level quite a bit, you know? How, how big a step was it from sort of, you know, you're a kid basically, 18 years old, guess you were moving out home, moving country, everything. How big a step was it from a, from a racing point of view and also just from a life point of view? I mean, the light, when I got on that plane to go to Europe, it's the first time I'd flown really, that I could remember. I'd flown when I was like a couple of years old, but you know, we grew up in very rural Canada and it was the first time. And then I remember just getting on the plane and, and you know, flying and landing in London Heathrow. And it's just like, I couldn't believe it. You know, it's just like this, it was like a city. It was so big, the airport and all this stuff. And it's just, it was like quite overwhelming. And it was quite a big step that also on the racing side, because I mean, the junior racing scene in Belgium was already, you know, super high level. You know, these kids are starting when they're so young and getting there in the first races and just the speed, you know, and you're on the first time, you're kind of really spinning out the 52 or it was the 5014 that you ride. Yeah. And it was a really big step. But then when I came back, you know, I really noticed the progression quite quickly. Yeah, so it's kind of funny that you say, oh, well, I started around 16 and I was already thinking, that's pretty late. You know, and you kind of 16, what do you know at 16 years old? And you go, well, as an athlete, these guys are, you know, they're riding bikes from five years old and, you know, they've got their family heritage, which goes yeah. with it. And they just, they're bred into it. And, you know, you pitch up flying into London and going, oh, yeah, this is a bit different. But it's funny though, because the, the, the Belgian guys, so the, the manager of the team, they really actually liked having me because what happens there is in Belgium is this kind of like, you know, they live at home for a very long time. They're kind of coddled, you know. We were doing a training camp, and remember this training camp was on the coast. So it was about an hour from where, we were, where I was living. And these guys my age were like, mom was coming and to do the laundry, and they didn't want to leave home. They were getting sad. And, you know, the, the manager of the team were like, look at this guy, you know, he's sort of come from Canada, he had no plan, he just rode over, he just came over here, you know? And, you know, you're here complaining because you're half an hour, an hour away from home, you know? So they kind of liked that, but it was, I mean, it was an incredible experience. I think in that time, you know, life skills changed a lot, you know? You just kind of realize a few things very quickly, you know, and that's just that, you know, my thing was always, if you get lost, I mean, you just have to ask for help. 
you know, that's the biggest thing. It's just someone will have an answer for you if you don't know where you're going or you don't know what you're doing. Or, and that and the other thing, you know, growing out and leaving home. And, and I think the biggest thing was that my parents were always just, you know, supportive. And they always said, oh, well, you can just come back. Yeah. You know, like if you go out there and you race your bike and it doesn't work out and it all goes pear-shaped, the worst case, you come home. You know, it's like, you know, we have a big house and you can always come home. And then we, there's always a job, there's always something here. And so that really allows you or gives you the confidence more to go out and take risks, you know, just try to pursue what you love to do. What gave you the, you know, the first sort of spark for bike racing? What did you, because in Canada it's like, it's not mainstream, is it? No, not at all. And where I grew up, even less so. I mean, I grew up ultra rural. You know, I grew up uh, 20 kilometers outside of a town that had maybe, maybe we have less than 10,000 people living there. You know, it's farming, yeah. farming, forestry, and, and everything. But I remember one day I went to uh, a magazine shop and they had these mountain bike magazines. And I just picked up this mountain bike magazine and I just, these mountain bikes look so, so awesome, you know, and there was more of the downhill side of things. And I was just so intrigued by the bikes yeah. and I thought, this is awesome, I really want to do it. And then I actually started, I started by racing downhill. So I raced downhill and then, well, when I was, when I started, I was too young to actually get a downhill license. You had to be junior age, so you had to be 17. So I kind of got a free ride bike and then I started more by racing cross country until I could get to be old enough to race downhill. Yeah. And then I raced downhill for a couple of years, racing cross country at the same time. So I'd race downhill on Saturday, do the cross country on Sunday. And then that sort of got to training a bit on the road for the mountain bike. And then quickly the road was kind of like this freedom, you know, you could just get on your bike and you could go far places and see a lot of things. and. And when you're young and don't have a car, it's kind of like, you know, I just loved exploring. And you could do 100K pretty easy, you know. And then from there, it just grew. And then I also eventually realized, look, if I want to be a professional bike rider, it's probably going to be on the road. You know, the mountain bike at the time was still quite big. You know, it was still hitting this, this big peak that it had. Was that sort of late 90s? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. just before that, I was just thinking how specialist bikes have become. And when I was racing, it's like you could take your same bike and do a downhill on as you did a cross country. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah exactly. We race a downhill with 60 mil of travel at the front end or something. It's like, yeah, that's just what it is. I remember yeah. it's like the Tomac era. Exactly. Hoydal and exactly. even Souser, yeah. Susie was racing yeah. cross country and downhill, mixing it up. And yeah. that was a golden era. Exactly. And then that's kind of like, I mean, it's the whole thing when you're a kid, you just, bike everything. I mean, you just go and you bike, you pedal, and I mean, you just kind of lose the sense of everything else. And so then I decided, look, if I want to be a professional, then I have to be on the road. And so I just started focusing more on the road. And then already at 18, I'd more or less stopped mountain biking and just focused on the road. Then quickly, you know, that after that year, I went to Belgium. Then that, that year, I did the Junior Worlds. And then things just kind of progressed from there. So despite being pretty multidisciplined, did you have an area where you really felt that you clicked, either time trialing or? When I was young, it was definitely time trialing. Yeah. It was kind of my forte. Do you think that comes from the mountain biking as well? I always find that good mountain bikers because it's just, yeah, you're in a big race, but it's just a time trial. It's oh, exactly, like, exactly. And I think as a young guy, I mean, all I ever wanted to do was go fast. Like this is like your obsession kind of is like, because when you're that young, you're not really doing that big of rides yet, you know? And, but what I always, I loved was, you know, the aerodynamics, the figuring things out and all the sort of kind of geeky stuff. And then, cause I, I was working at a bike shop in town, which is about 20 kilometers. So I would ride back and forth. And then I would do like, you know, I'd have my, put my aero bars on and I just try to go as, home as fast bike. as I can. Yeah. <laughs> well, a mountain bike I used to ride, I said the mountain bikes in the winter, I'd also ride to work. Yeah. And we, it was snow, you know, it's snow in Eastern Canada. So I'd ride to work on the mountain bike in the winter, which is pretty fun. Right. So do you find that in your sort of quest for speed, coffee became a big part of it earlier on? Coffee came a little bit later. Coffee came when I was probably, I'd then been 
racing on a Canadian team, Symmetrics, and we did a race in Portland, Oregon. In it would have been early 2000s, yeah, early to mid 2000s. And I remember we went. It was Mount Hood Classic, and we, a friend, one of my teammates, lived in Portland, so we were staying at his house. And just around the corner from him was a, a cafe called Stumptown. And now, I mean, it's a very famous, famous place. And they had the shop, and they were roasting inside, so you could have a drink, and you could sit there, and you could watch them roasting. And I remember sitting there and ordering these drinks, and they were like these cappuccinos, and they only came in one size, you know. They steamed the milk per cup, and I just remember sitting there drinking, and they say, and I just couldn't believe that this is what coffee could taste like. Like, it tasted so sweet and chocolatey, and the milk was so creamy, and you know, it just had this microfoam, and it was just this whole sensory experience, and sitting there and watching the guy roast it right there, and from that moment, it was kind of like I was, I was hooked. And it became a lot of time just searching for that same experience again. Less so doing it myself as it was then searching out other cafes, finding other places um, in Vancouver, in the, in the West Coast. I was in Vancouver at that, at that time, on the West Coast. And then eventually when I got to Europe, it kind of changed a little bit because now it's like away from the coffee culture because in Spain, didn't exist you know it's growing now but then it didn't exist you know and so i had my at first you know seiko super automatic machine at home and i would get my beans from all over and people would send me some and when someone came over I'd, they'd bring some and then maybe f four or five years ago i got my first real machine i got a rocket espresso machine for home and then from there just kind of like escalated very very quickly. So within a year, I, you know, upgraded the, the espresso machine, and then the next year I was roasting at home. I bought a roaster, so I was roasting all the beans at home and doing that. And then the year after, more or less, we opened La Fabrica, and then it became roasting uh, for La Fabrica, which is when we opened Espresso Mock. Espresso Mock is actually came from the the need, the want to roast our own coffee, right. and that was born and then we just it just kept growing so we started with a three kilo roaster in in, in mafia now just last week we upgraded now we have a 15 kilo roaster so it's just kind of like the coffee thing and, and you just kind of it all comes back to this kind of obsession still with trying to find that same experience i had it would be 15 years ago now you know and trying to find that same coffee and then traveling the world and trying coffees and and different things and then how you can, you know, manipulate it, how you can get there and, and do these things. And it's about, you know, for me, I'm still searching to try to produce the, holy the best coffee that I can. Yeah. So whereabouts are you on the scale now from your, that experience 15 years ago? Because obviously over time, everything just vintage. It gets that much better in your mind. And are you on a, a seven or an eight or a nine? <laughs> still searching? Still searching. I mean, yeah. I've... Uh, you know, I, things also changed because I used to, like, I used to always drink milk-based drinks. Like, I loved the flat white, you know, the perfect, the perfect ratio of the espresso and the milk and the sweetness and everything and trying to get that dialed. And then now it's kind of become a little bit more kind of espresso-obsessed, you know, and you go through these phases because you kind of, you have a good one. Last year I was in, in Melbourne and I had a, an espresso that just really blew my mind, you know? And then it becomes this, this, how did that happen? How did they make it? How can I do it? How can I get there, you know? And so then you just set off on this path, like, you know, we were talking earlier about, about athletes. And I think what makes an athlete a good athlete is typically that we're quite obsessive with with whatever we're doing. I was going to say, it's like one of those things where you've, you've almost been able to learn through the pro racing yeah. and all the different processes you go through, uh, trying to find that extra saving of, of you know, aerodynamics and saving watts and being more efficient. And you just translate that, translate that over to another, yeah. another field of expertise and exactly. the mindset's still the same there. Exactly. And I think because what we're also trying to do is Everything that we do, I mean, if we, if it's, if it's riding or if it's, you know, La Fabrica or Mafia, the service course, we're trying not only just to, it's not just about opening a shop, 
it's not just about doing something. It's about, you know, my goal really, if you get there or not, is a different story. But my goal is to be a reference, not in Girona or Spain or in Europe. It's to try to be a reference in the world. I mean, you want to be the best that you can be. And I, know, I think it's not about saying, oh, I want to have the best coffee shop in Girona. No, nah, that's not really the issue. Like, I want, to, I want to make an espresso that's as good as the best in the world. And again, if you get there or not, that's a different story. But you have to go with this, with this idea of, you know, your, your, your vision has to be more global, you know. And then when people actually come in and they see it, you know, here in Girona, they think, oh, wow, this is super cool. And you're still thinking, like, wow, like, actually, it could be, it could be this, you know. Yeah. And which is good and bad because, one, it, 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 you know, you end up with, maybe a good product, but on the other side, it's, you never stop. Yeah. I mean, you're always still searching because you know there's always something better out there and you want to be as good or, or better. That's interesting. Obviously, you ended your career early and, and moved in this direction. Is there anything, always looking for that, that next step and you are sort of searching for something better, is there anything that you feel that you, you maybe didn't achieve in your career before, before retiring? I know you did all the grand tours and you're a selfless worker, really. It's like you're in the service industry again. It's yeah. like helping people. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Like I, I don't look back at my career with, with any regret or that I missed anything or that there's anything that I didn't get to do. Or, I mean, I, like I said, I think, you know, for me, being a professional was, was riding my bike. That's all I wanted to do. And for the beginning, I wanted to be a domestique. That was just... Watching, that's kind of when I watch, I remember watching these first tours when I was working at the bike shop in a small town, you know, watching these tours with, with Lance and these guys, and it was, you know, it was the team. For me, it was the workers that were, you know, the stars of that show. You know, when you sit and they had all those guys lined up, and just giving it, and you know, what did Lance typically do a lot of the last few K, you know, and it was kind of this, this other side of it that I was really drawn to. And, and I think that's sort of, so for me to go back, I mean, we, I worked with some really great riders over the years who won some really great races. You know, we won, for me, the Ardennes was always a races that I really enjoyed. You know, I did quite well there as, a, as an under 23. And then to go and, and actually win it with Simon Gerrans was pretty special. And to go into those races with really one of the, the real favorites to win and to always be either win or knocking on the door is pretty yeah. neat, yeah. you know. And then also we had plenty of GC guys. I mean, we, I mean, there were some really awesome guys that I rode with. And then obviously doing the tour was kind of a moment where you really realize, okay, now I could stop because I've really kind of done everything. And the tour was pretty crazy because I got called up very late, you know. I was actually in... I was in Vegas on holiday with my wife when they called me and then I basically flew straight to the UK and started more or less the next day having not ridden my bike in almost a week, you know, and just enjoying life, enjoying Vegas, you know, so it's kind of like, which also changed a lot of things for me because in that moment I realized that we're maybe putting way too much into it, you know, because I come from having probably what was, would be considered the absolute worst preparation to having a fantastic race, you know? Maybe because you're so relaxed, it's like... Exactly, no exactly. And so once that, the tour, we kind of did that, that's actually after that when we decided to open La Fabrica, you know, because we'd sort of gotten to this point where, not that it was a real kind of what's next moment, but you know, we dedicated a lot to our cycling career. When I say we, my wife and I, I mean, she came over and she was supporting me 100% for, you know, the eight years previous to that. And so we kind of got to this moment where we'd done the tour, which for us was, a, or for me, was a big goal, which in turn was for us for was a big goal. And, you know, I remember we went to the beach and it was kind of like, well, she was also a very ambitious person, you know, she loved to work. Mm. And we kind of got to this point where it was like, look, I need, my wife's, I need to start doing something. You know, we've kind of like, We've had these, this time and it's been awesome. You know, we've got to do a lot of really great stuff. I got to live in Europe, we got to travel, we got to do all this. But now it's kind of time that I need to start doing something. You know, and it's kind of, 
I think a lot of times this, this lifestyle can be very romanticized, you know, about, oh, you're living in Europe and, you know, this must be so nice and you don't have to work and do this. But in reality, it's honestly, for her, it was a very, very, let's say, lonely lifestyle. You know, the, that year that I did the tour, I did 160 days on the road. Yeah. You know, so that's almost half a year gone. And she's here in Girona. And there's some friends, you know, but it's still, you know, there's 24 hours in a day then. Yeah. And you go for a walk for a couple of hours, or you get a coffee for an hour. That still leaves a big part of the day. And if you're not there, then, I mean, they're not cooking, they're not doing. I mean, it's just like yeah. there's not much to do. Well, let's be honest, when you're back, you're probably not going to be much fun anyway. You're traveling back, you're knackered, you've got the next race, you've got the director and the team, blah, 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 this is what you're doing next, you're exactly. out on the bike, you're training, recovering, then you're away again. Yeah. <laughs> and typically on, on our team, and, and you know, I've proven over the years to be quite reliable, and they knew that you know, if they phoned me up, they could phone me up and send me to any race, and I'd be more or less useful in, in any sort of situation. Yeah. And so a lot of times I was getting called up pretty late and, and things like that, but... You know, she was like, look, I need to start doing something and, and, you know, maybe I'll go back to Vancouver for a couple months at a time, do some stuff and do this. We can kind of like figure it out, you know. And so we basically kind of said like, I said, oh, well, let's just, we had the idea to do a coffee shop, but we were going to wait until I'd finished my career. And then it was kind of like, well, let's just, just go for it, you know. And we started the process and it was ridiculously hard in the beginning because, well, we got things figured out, but in the, in the first business, we really learned a lot of things the hard way, you know, and, 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 you know, we opened and we did this stuff and we had, you know, uh, basically some licensing issues and we had to close down again and we had to add bathroom. We had to do so much stuff. And again, it was like what we were talking about earlier. You have this persistence, you know, that you want to keep going and that, you know, stopping or failure is not really an option. Like, that's not, that's not how you do it. It's not, it's not a failure. It's, it's a roadblock and it's, it just needs to find a solution to do it. But I think many people probably would have stopped. If you, if you knew it was going to be this, as difficult as you obviously know it is now, do you reckon you would have started it? Yeah. You still would have? Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, I think, at the end of the day, like I say, it was difficult, but we just had to find solutions. And at the end of the day, that's getting the right people or asking someone or figuring it out, and it takes time and effort, but you can always get there, you know, if you just keep going. And that's the difficult part, I think. A lot I of really do. believe in, um, you know, the foundations of a good business, you have those hardships. And if you're learning and teaching yourself, that's just, it sets you up uh, from, from some of our personal experiences, what we've been doing. And, yeah, it's the behind the scenes which really counts. And it's yeah. generally the behind the scenes that not that many people ever get to, to have a look at. And you, you make the mistakes and you learn from them and you have those days and nights where you're like, I don't know what we're gonna do here. No, it's and fine. you get it's over a... it and yeah, you're just a stronger person, so. And I remember reading this, this thing a while ago about entrepreneurship. And it was kind of interviewing this group of entrepreneurs and all these sorts of business people. And, and the question sort of was, is there a secret to being a successful entrepreneur? And the answer was no, we all just wing it. You know, you just go, you take it as it comes and you figure out the solutions to problems as they come. I mean, there's no, there's no answer. Yeah. I mean, you don't know, you just have to get in there and, and go for it, you know? And the nice thing is, I mean, the, the beautiful thing is it's, it's a lot like bike riding in the sense that what you put in is a direct correlation of what comes out. Yeah. So in bike riding, if you're willing to train hard, and I mean, I think for me, I was never really a, this big natural talent by any means, you know? I was just a person who, you know, I grew up on a farm and all this sort of stuff. So it was like work, I mean, we were working like from childhood. And so you, the thing I did have was a work ethic from my parents, you know, they're both German and they both just work their asses off, you know? Mm. And, but I was just a normal person who was willing to work hard. And that's where I could be a professional cyclist. Or maybe it could have been something else, or but cycling was what I was, you know, passionate about at the time. 
And my parents always told us from very young, like, you can do anything yeah. if you want to. You just have to be willing it's to do to it. It's great to have that support as well. Just to yeah, I mean, they, they, from, they, from day one, they always just like, look, you have to do whatever you do. You just have to do something that you're, that you're passionate about. Yeah. Like if, if you don't love what your, your work is, it's, life's too hard. Yeah, you have I to mean, figure out something that you love to that's do. That's exactly why we're sat here now. It's, uh, and there's no one came with the, you know, the contracts saying, yeah. hey, come around and interview yeah. some guys and see what happens yeah, in the exactly. bike world. It's like just so my previous jobs and that just sat there going, I can't do this forever. Yeah. There's no way it's going to happen. So you try and create a niche. And I think it was really interesting what you said about entrepreneurship and, you know, what you said as a kid. And I think we've all had this essence of just exploring on the bike. And you've got that. I, mean, I really like to get inside people's heads sometimes about what makes them do what they're mm. doing, like whether it's a, a race or a, a business. And it's all, it all comes down to how you define that, that term, exploration. And mm. you explore on the bike as a kid, and then you're like, well, where can this take me? And it took you racing, took you around the world. It made sure that you met a bunch of different people, mm -hmm. contacts, teams. And now you're exploring this next part. It's like, I bet the drive and the, the feeling's almost the same. It certainly is for me. The feeling when I have the business and how I'm going to pull that piece together and make the jigsaw fit, it's the same as going for a big bike ride where I don't know, on roads I've never been on. <laughs> it's kind I think of, that's kind of like very much like you said. When I, you know, the reason that I sort of also stopped, I decided to stop from cycling was I had gotten to this point in, with coffee and I was at the same point where I was when I was a junior when I picked up this mountain bike magazine. Yeah. You know, I'd sort of gotten hooked, and then it's a sort of you're reading the books, you're on the forums, you're getting all the information you can, and you're doing everything you can, and there's this excitement that, about what you're doing or what you don't know and what you can learn. And so the same that happened when I was a junior riding was happening to me in the coffee. So then all of a sudden it becomes, you know, I'm so into this coffee world. I still love riding my bike, but what's happening now? Racing is keeping me from being able to explore the coffee. Mm -hmm. oh, I'd love to go to this coffee festival. Well, no, I have to do the Giro. It's like, you know, you, you kind of, it's holding me back. So basically what I want to do is like, look, I still love riding my bike and I'll still always ride my bike. That's not the problem. But I want to do the coffee stuff and I want to take the coffee further and let's say be a coffee professional. So, well, then I have to give up something else and that was racing. And so I said, look, I just want to stop racing so I can focus on, on coffee, you know? It would seem that certainly the business which you build up in a relatively short space of time, you've got the Fabrica, Mafia, and now you've got the service course as well. It almost seems like, well, one, it's snowballing, but at the same time, having the two coffee shops and maybe branching out in the coffee would have been the logical step forward. Like, where was the inspiration for the service course and, and what you're doing now with this? Well, the service course came from having La Fabrica. And Girona, as we know, is a cycling mecca now. And it's become this real, you know, must-see destination as a, as, as a serious cyclist. And we started to see this, this evolution in, in the cycling tourism growing in the last couple of years. And the client of service course has already been coming to La Fabrica for the last couple of years. And we saw those people, you know, and, and I was talking to these people, you know, because I'm just curious to why you're here and what are you doing? Yeah. What's your background? And a lot of times it was these people, and, and it was a level of, of, of cycle tourists that was looking for a service that didn't exist yet. You know, they wanted, um, typically, these are people that are coming on holiday and they want just a week and they want the best that they can get for the week. You know, so things that were missing was, you know, a workshop in Girona or, you know, Durace level rental bikes or, you know, a shop in Girona that carried, you know, let's say the latest stuff. Yeah. You know, like people on the holidays, they also want to shop, they want to do nice stuff. They, it's, it's a good time for shopping. For people. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I just wanted to create a space that, I mean, all these years of being a professional athlete or a world tour rider, you basically, the service course is how we got treated there. Yeah. You know, it's the idea is 
you know, after your ride, have a shower, throw the laundry outside, and then it's done the next day sort of thing, you know. And that then allows people to come, leave all the bike stuff here, you know, leave your dirty bike, we'll wash it, leave your laundry, we'll wash it, you know, you can come for a massage after, you can do all that stuff. But when you walk out the door after your ride, if you, when you walk out the door of the service course, you're on vacation mode. Yeah. It's not about dragging your bike up the stairs to your apartment or trying to figure out to wash it if it's gotten dirty or where can I do my laundry. It's just no, leave all that stuff here and leave all that you know, stress or that small stuff here and just go out and enjoy the rest of your vacation, which is what Girona has that's so beautiful. We've got culture, we've got food, we've got you know, all these beautiful things you know, that, that make us such a holiday destination, not only a cycling destination, but you, know, you can come to Girona with your family and they're going to have a good time when you're riding. It's just, there's, it has so much to offer that we just want to take the bike stuff and just let you yeah. deal with that. And then it's kind of like growing organically again, just through passion, you know. I love bikes, you know, so we've got some, you know, we work with some cool brands, and we've got some really great bike stuff, and, and typically what we do, because we're not really a standard shop in the sense that, you know, we, we offer services, which is a revenue, we offer some other stuff, which is a revenue, so everything adds a little bit, which kind of allows us to do a little bit more of what we want, so I kind of really only want to sell the stuff that I think is cool, yeah. and it's typically what you find mostly in the shop is just stuff that I like, that I think other people will like, yeah. you know? And what we're offering in all of our things is just what we like, that we think other people will like, you know? And I think that's an important part about having a business is being authentic, you know? I wanna sell something that I believe is a good product, that I believe is cool, that I believe looks good, you know? At the end of the day, it's, it's as much about feeling good, looking good as, as it is riding fast, you know? This is, this is cycling. And that's one thing that also changed a bit from when I stopped, you know, when I was a rider, it becomes very much a, your work, you know, like biking is work. Your bike is a work tool, you know, this is what you get given, this is what you are, which is great because that's how the world works, you know, you need the sponsors to make the teams run um, and they're all offering great equipment. But then when you step back and it's like, okay, now I'm buying my own bike for the first time in how many years? or you know I'm starting to pick stuff or the big thing is just learning about things again you know we knew a lot about our team sponsor stuff but it's such a big world you know and they offered great stuff but you know if you spend I spent you know five years in Orca so that's five years with Shimano five years with Scott five years with and again they're all offering great products but when you leave and you start to you sort of this, this passion comes back because now you can like start reading about things, learning about things, you know, talking with people about other bikes, offering people things that you think are great or try this or try that. And it's actually brought back quite a bit of passion again for the bike itself. You know, it was previously, it started to feel like a work tool. Now it's again something that, yes. that you, have a, you have an attachment with. You know, you build this bike and you you know, you pick your, all your pieces and you're changing pieces. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's, it's a like great going feeling. back to school again and you're feeling like a kid. And I think that's really nice because, you know, after so many years in the pro peloton and that, you know, you don't want to leave and just feel like exhausted with cycling because that's what's made you the career. That's who you are. So to be able to take that back now and almost relive your childhood with building up custom bikes and making other people happy as well. I remember building custom bikes and I still, I don't know, it's in you. You just want to pick the right bits and you know that you put everything on that bike, which is absolutely what you want. And you know, it can take you months to build up a really cool bike. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, the feeling's there. And sometimes the time it's, it takes to actually build it up is it's where the value is. You want it to be like, take this process and just like, yeah, I've done everything I can to make the yeah. coolest product. I mean, I think it's about, it's about also like you're saying, it's that slowing down process. You know, we live in a really high-paced life. We live in a world of instant gratification. You can buy everything online in one click and it arrives the next day or less. It can arrive in two hours. Yeah. You know, and it's about, you know, let's slow it down a little bit. Let's take the time. Let's sit down. Let's do a bit of research, learn about what we're buying and, and what we want. And maybe this is a bit better for you than that. And, you know, you start building these, again, these small emotional connections with what you're doing. And then in, in the end, you build something that, 
you don't have all these friends who <clears throat> have you know, a plethora of bikes. And the carbon ones are like trading cards. Every year they're changing, oh, you know, sell that and buying this one, sell that. The steel one, you, keep it real. you know, it's the one bike they have for life because it's like you build this, this connection, you have something that's, you understand it's handmade, you know, you've put time into it, they've put time into it, and you have this connection that you're just not gonna let it go. Even if you don't ride it all the time, yeah. it's still not one that you're gonna give away or trade or sell or this, you know, so I think these are the types of things, that's the area that we're trying to focus on, is that emotional connection. You did say that it's about sort of, we live in this fast-paced world and that, and uh, slowing down a bit, but it doesn't strike me that you're slowing down that much with everything you're doing here. You've got to, I'm sure there's other things you're saying, yeah, this is what it is now, but up here somewhere there's the bigger oh, picture. I, mean, I, where think, are you, I think where that's are you never going to stop. I think that's, it's your personality, yeah. you know. You really seem very much the same, that it's your personality that you always want to have, you know, my biggest quote that my wife will tell you is when I always tell her every day, like, oh, I have an idea, you know? Yeah, like, oh, God, here we yeah. go. <laughs> and, you know, she supported a lot of them. <laughs> but, uh, we have a similar thing where yeah. it's literally, uh, we think, oh, yeah, we've just about got everything under control. And then it's like we take on a bunch of other stuff and I go, oh, yeah, we could do some more over here and we can go to that place and we can film these guys. And yeah, up until, like, let's just say, 12 hours ago, I didn't yeah. know this was going to happen. And yeah. it's kind of these yeah. things come together and it's like, yeah. yeah, well, we're here. Let's try and, yeah. and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I love giving myself more work. It's just yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like every time that, you know, one of the businesses started sort of settling in and the chaos is gone, yeah. it's like, uh, it's like uh, you kind of end up doing the next one. And you just don't really know. Like this the service course is very much uh, an opportunity, you know, mm -hmm. We saw it, it it's, it's a passion of ours. We both like hospitality and I like biking. So we saw the need and we're like, okay, no one's really doing this specific thing that we, we wanna do. So let's do it, you know, and it was, we found the space, yeah. which is also an opportunity because we originally had sort of two ideas that we were going to do with and for businesses, and, and this one was a bit more time sensitive, I thought, like well, this one kind of needs to be done now. Yeah. But then also finding a space, finding a space that's big, let's say in the old city or in the city center, it's very difficult, you know, and we, we happen to find it and, you know, the guy who owns it is just also cycling crazy. So it's kind of, yeah. you know, he loved the concept and he loved the idea. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, everything started going pretty quickly and, and like, but you have to just go with the flow a bit, you know? see what happens and I think the biggest thing is also just being open to you know you can't be going with the blinders on you know as much as you're focused on one thing it's about also you know absorbing and seeing and what's going on and feeling what's out there and feeling you know the atmosphere and, and what the opportunities are you know because you have to be open and they don't just come and present themselves on the silver platter. Right? Well I've got to say um, just want to sort of acknowledge really for, for what you've done as a bike rider and now in the second part of your life uh, what you've created is something truly special um, we've had a look around and you know we're uber geeks as well so everything which is hanging on the walls and the pictures and it's a beautiful establishment with the coffee and tying it in with service course I think uh, if anyone comes to Girona and they come here they're gonna have a pretty special trip so thank you very much thank you very much for your thank time you. Christian we really thank appreciate you. it and uh, maybe get a bike ride in one day yeah yeah <laughs> thank you Cheers.